All right, say it with me. This, this is, is not, not a, a cleaver. cleaver. Welcome back to Gearheads. While Hannah's still out on maternity leave, we are joined once again by Kate. So happy to be here. And we're gonna talk about knives, Japanese knives to be exact. Japanese knives like Kyoto, Nakiri, and Santoku have been rising rapidly in popularity. They're prized for their precision and beautiful ergonomic designs. Should you have one in your kitchen? Today, Kate and I are gonna get up close and personal with some of the best Japanese knives on the market. We'll review how they're made, how to use them, and more so you can decide if they're right for you. But first, we have a book coming out. It's called Kitchen Gear, The Ultimate Owner's Manual. The two of us have 30 years of combined experience testing kitchen gear, and we've packed all of our favorite tips and tricks into this book. We give you our unbiased take on what's worth buying and what's not. Plus, you'll find over 100 ATK recipes that bring out the best in your gear. Get your copy of Kitchen Gear, the Ultimate Owner's Manual today. First up, Lisa with the Gyuto. The Gyoto is a knife that was developed in the 1870s in Japan, and that was at the end of a period of 250 years of isolation. At that time, Western influence started to permeate Japanese culture, and food and kitchen gear was no exception. So the Gyoto is a Western-influenced Japanese knife that's probably the closest thing to an all-purpose chef's knife. These knives are great. If you have one, let me know in the comments. You know, a lot of our test cooks love them and use them every day. So how are Gyuto different from Western style chef's knives? First, weight. Generally, these are very lightweight compared to some typical chef's knives from the West. The knives that we tested weighed from three to five ounces. A lot of Western style knives are much heavier, although our favorite from Victorinox is fairly lightweight. The blade design is also different. Now, Gyuto are generally narrower from spine to edge. So this is the spine and this is the cutting edge and they're thinner from here to here than Western style chef's knives. The blade also tends to be less tall and less curved at the bottom. They also lack a bolster, which is that vertical piece of metal at the end of the blade. Many chef's knives from the West have that bolster. Japanese knives tend not to. That spine being narrower means that it's less of a wedge when you're cutting into food. It's sliding in a little bit more gracefully and less pressing the food apart. The lack of bolster means that the blade is lighter. It's also easier to sharpen because when you get to that back part of the knife, when there's a bolster that goes all the way to the heel of the blade, you can't pull it through a knife sharpener or when you're going over a whetstone, you're gonna hit that spot. And so it's easier to get the whole edge sharp to to the same extent. They also tend to be straighter across with less of a bowed shape. There's less of a rocking motion and more of a slicing motion. The next big difference is blade material. So in general, Japanese knives have a harder steel than Western knives. And that means that they can get them very, very, very thin. That also makes them more brittle. You don't want to chop into a pumpkin or a squash. You don't want to chop up frozen foods. You want to do more push-pull cuts and slicing boneless meats or vegetables and just being a lot more delicate with this than you would a Western knife. These knives are about precision. It's about finely cut, well-presented food. You know, most Japanese food is already cut for you and the presentation is very important. The pieces are very regular. So you get the benefit of that really tremendous technical precision with these knives. So a lot of traditional Western chef's knives, that tradition came from Germany. Uh, companies like Wusthof and Henkels, they were much bigger and heavier. They had 22 degree angles on the edge of the knife. So when you have the, the point of the knife, 22 degree angles on either side. A lot of Japanese knives are much thinner. They can be down to 10 degrees, so much narrower edges. A Japanese knife, will sometimes have what's called an asymmetrical bevel, where one side is a different angle from the other side. Western knives tend to be symmetrical, the same edge angle on each bevel, on each side of the cutting edge. You'll see the asymmetry described in terms of a ratio. So you'll see things like 80-20, 70-30, even 90-10. If you have an asymmetrical edge, the knife will kind of guide through the food a little bit differently. If you wanna buy one of these knives and you were gonna buy one that's an asymmetrical bevel, you got to really learn how to sharpen it on a whetstone or take them to someone who knows how to take care of them. We do have information about that, the places that we recommend on our website. Any knife has got to be sharpened periodically or it's really worthless. 
For this review, we looked at Guto that were 210 centimeters, or about 8.2 inches. And that's because it's closest to what we like for our typical all-purpose chef's knife, which is eight inches. There really were no duds in this lineup. It really just came down to a few distinctions in performance, sharpness, and comfort. Some of the factors to think about are the blade material. Stainless steel versus carbon steel. Stainless steel is great because you're not gonna have to worry about keeping it dry, it's not gonna rust or change appearance. A carbon steel blade, some people love the way it develops a patina and changes as you use it. But you need to know that going in, you may need to remember to keep it wiped dry and clean so that it's not gonna rust. Those factors of carbon versus stainless steel applies to all knives, not just Japanese knives. We tested knives with both Japanese style handles and Western style handles. I was very surprised by how much I loved this Japanese style handle. It's got a really light feel to it. It's very easy to hold on to, and it really helps make the knife very easy to work with. It's surprisingly comfortable. This one is a typical Western chef's knife handle, and it is a little bit heavier. And if you like that feeling, that's great. But you should try to pick up both and decide which is right for you. So what makes a Japanese style handle distinctive? As you can see, it's set back a little farther from the blade. You see this neck of the knife is sticking out a little bit. It tends to be a longer handle, at least makes the knife overall longer than some of the other knives. You can see that these are technically the same size blade, but the handle makes it much longer. A Western style handle, smoother, it's a little bit heavier, and it's a little bit closer to the knife. We have two co-winners and a best buy. The first is a Japanese handle and it's by Hitohira and it is really a fantastic knife. It is so lightweight, it's sharp and it's so easy to use. Everyone fell in love with this knife. This is our other co-winner by Masamoto. This has a Western style handle. It's a little bit heavier than the Hitohira. That gives some people a little feeling of power, a little bit of control that they like in a heavier knife. It's still not as heavy as some Western style knives, but it's a little heavier than this one. Very, very sharp, glides through food. We loved it. They're beautiful knives and you'll love them, but they're about $200. So if you want an alternative, we chose a Best Buy. It was only about $50, which is pretty amazing because this is a great little knife. It's by Kanetsugu. This one is a little bit less sharp than the other two. The handle was a little bit more roughly finished, but either way, it was a great knife. Next up, here's Kate with some more excellent Japanese knives. Traditionally, the nakiri was one of the most important knives in Japanese home kitchens. It's meant for slicing, dicing, and chopping vegetables, which form the backbone of Japanese cuisine. It has a rectangular blade and a double beveled, fairly straight cutting edge, and also a pretty blunt tip. And that straight cutting edge means that it's meant to be used pretty parallel to the cutting board in a roughly up and down motion, as opposed to rocking like you would with a Western chef's knife. The tall blades are really helpful when you're cutting large vegetables like a big cabbage or working through a big pile of greens. It helps you kind of keep everything in line as you're cutting. They're also great for scooping up the food once you're done cutting or slicing it. But you should never drag the blade because it's fragile and it will chip. We found that nakiri that were about six and a half inches long and two inches tall were best. Some blades were too long or too thick, which felt imprecise and kind of clunky. Like the Gyuto that Lisa talked about, nakiri are made from really high quality steel. They're very thin. The spine is almost as thin as the cutting edge. This makes them great for precision tasks where you really want to be careful and get super precise, accurate results, but they're not meant for breaking down chickens. You don't want to cut through bone. You don't want to cut anything frozen. This is not a cleaver. I know the shape resembles one. You might think that you can just hack at food with this, but that's not what these knives are designed for. Nakiri are meant to be used more gently, stick to things where precision is really important. Like a lot of Japanese knives, Nakiri are pretty lightweight. You're using them to cut through a lot of food. Some of the Nakiri we tested were heavier, and as we used them throughout testing, we found that they really felt like the cleavers that these are not supposed to be. So testers' arms got tired. Another big factor is the tang, which is how much metal extends into the handle. When the tang is longer, it's heavier. The Nakiri that we liked best weighed about five to six ounces and had thin blades. The best Nakiri had textured materials that were easy to grip. You're prepping a lot of vegetables, you're washing vegetables, you're washing your hands, so you want a knife that is still really easy to hold securely, even if it happens to get wet. 
As with the Gyuto, the material of the blade is really chef's choice. There's carbon steel, there's stainless steel, both are great. It really depends on what you personally prefer. Through testing, we found three favorites. Each have different pros and cons, but generally have everything we're looking for in this style of knife. This is our stainless steel favorite from Masamoto Sohonten. Some things we loved about this knife were its tall blade, its flat cutting surface makes it really easy for you to make contact with the cutting board. The handle is an oval Japanese style handle made from magnolia wood. It was super comfortable for testers to grip. Everyone really liked the way that it felt in their hands and found it really easy to hold in a variety of positions. It also had really good traction when it was wet, which we thought was super important. And this is our carbon steel favorite from Sakai Kikumori. It has the tallest blade and also the thinnest blade of anything we tested. And although it's carbon steel, a lot of the blade is clad in stainless steel. That means that your daily maintenance and care of this knife is going to be a little bit easier than you normally think of with a carbon steel knife. It also has this really nice octagonal Japanese style handle. It was really grippy, really comfortable to hold, also just really beautiful. And this is our best buy from Masutani. Our other two favorites are upwards of $200, but this is about 70. So although it wasn't quite as good as them in some areas, it's still a really great knife, excellent craftsmanship, and considerably less expensive. Compared to our favorites, it's narrower from top to bottom. So when you're chopping really tall vegetables, you'll have a little bit less command, but this is still a really great Nakiri. This is one of our newest knife reviews, so I don't own a Nakiri yet, but I've been playing around with them to get ready for this video, and it has been so much fun. I was slicing a red pepper, and I was just floored by how easy it was. The knife just slid through the pepper, didn't get stuck on the skin, and at home, I'm not fussy about things being super precise and really photo camera ready, but when I looked down at my cutting board, I had just this pile of perfectly even, gorgeous red pepper, and that's definitely because I was using one of these knives. Unlike a Western knife, which I sort of typically use at home, which are much thicker, these have narrower blades, so that means when you're cutting, you're not wedging the knife into something, you're really slicing it super cleanly and that leads to really impressive precision and also just a really fun cooking experience. Next, the Santoku. This was developed in post-war Japan as an all-purpose cooking knife for home cooks. Like the Nakiri that I just talked about, it has a fairly tall blade and the edge is also fairly straight. A big difference here is that it has a rounded tip. It quickly became Japan's most popular kitchen knife and is wildly popular in the United States too. So, what makes a good Santoku? First, you want a slim, sharp cutting edge. Most Santoku we tested had the typical Japanese blade angle of 15 degrees, but some were as small as 10 degrees. Many Santoku traditionally have a more rounded sheep's foot towards the tip. Our testers preferred Santoku that had a slightly less rounded tip. It was just a little easier for them to work and maneuver. Our favorites had a spine thickness that was about two millimeters. As with all knives, the handle is really important. With Santoku, you want to look for something with a moderate length and a moderate width. This is an all-purpose knife, so you're going to be holding it in all sorts of ways as you slice and dice and chop things. So a neutral shape is really key. It'll be much more comfortable. On some of the knives we've tested over the years, there's a piece of metal that sticks out above the top of the handle. And when you're using a pinch grip to really push with this knife, that metal digs into the underside of your hand. It's just not comfortable. So look for something that's nice and smooth on top. Newer Santoku, including many of the models we tested, do have a slight curve towards the tip. This makes them good for a rocking motion as you cut. That's great for mincing herbs. Also, if you're accustomed to using a Western style chef's knife, that motion will feel really familiar to you. We we also tested Santoku that had granton edges, or little hollows carved into the blade. These are supposed to prevent food from sticking as you slice or chop it. We found they didn't actually make a difference. Knives that had a perfectly smooth blade performed just as well. This is our winner from Misono. It impressed testers who'd use Santoku and those who were new to them. It's sharp, it's agile, the balance of the knife is really great. This is really an excellent all-purpose knife. It features an asymmetrical blade sharpened at a 70-30 bevel, which the company hand sharpens for either righties or lefties.
we also have a Best Buy from Mac. The handle was a little bulky, especially for testers with smaller hands, and the overall length of the knife was a little short at 11 and a quarter inches, but overall, it's still a really great Santoku. Santoku are excellent knives, and I find that often people will have a Santoku and they'll have a Western chef's knife at home, and just depending on the day, their mood, the thing they're cutting, they'll use one or the other. A Santoku is a great all-purpose option for just about anyone's kitchen. We loved the majority of the Japanese knives knives we tested. They were sharp, they were comfortable, they were a joy to work with. If you're in the market for a new knife, you should definitely consider one of these Japanese knives. For more information on these knives and all the other models we tested, check out the links below or go to americastestkitchen.com. Do you have any Japanese knives? Let us know in the comments. We'd love to hear about them. And be sure to like and subscribe so you never miss an episode.